Hi, Ian. Thank you so much for joining us on Ask the Email Expert YouTube series on Mailbird. We're really happy to have you. It is fantastic to be here. Awesome. So let's just get started right off the bat. I want to ask you first on just your professional personal tips, and then you can go into the business side of the email. But what's your relationship like with your inbox? And what are some of the tools that you use to stay on top of everything or tips? Okay, um, so with my, it's horrible is my relationship with my inbox. I think like most people, I mean, the reality is most people struggle, I think, with email. I'm not going to kind of sit here and pretend I'm some kind of paragon of productivity. I think I'm, a, I'm as hopeless as everyone else. Same kind of foibles and weaknesses as normal human beings. I am really lazy, which is, I think, quite useful because it forces me to, you know, in order to remain lazy and not have to do a lot of work, I, I'm quite good at finding little shortcuts and quick ways of doing things. So that's maybe one of my superpowers is because of my laziness, um, and my desire not to work very hard uh, or very long. I'm quite good at that. So in terms of my inbox, um, a couple of things. So one is, I guess, from a more strategic perspective, one thing I have got quite good at, um, and I would say the, the number one thing is just to avoid your inbox for, for a certain amount of time. Just don't be, don't, be, don't be under its control. You be the master of your inbox rather than vice versa. So like most people, my business is really dr driven by emails. I mean, that's where, you know, clients contact me. They even, even like if they're on my live chat on my website, I'm, because I'm not permanently on there, it's going to come in through email. Customer questions are going to come in through email, either people who don't work with me yet or people who do work with me. They're all going to be emailing me. Useful info, come, loads of stuff comes in by email. So most of my to-do list comes from email. So I can't avoid email. It's not like I'm a kind of professor in a university where I can disappear off for six months and cut myself off from the world. It's just that's just not the reality for most of us, is it? So I have to deal with email. But I think the first secret is you have to kind of master it and use it when is appropriate for you, because the the flip side of email, I think, is that it is a, like other forms of social media. It's the original distraction. Um, so just to go back a little bit I'd, before I tell you the answer. The problem I was finding was I was finding it far too easy to just go and check email as a as a distraction from my real work. So there are certain things you do in work which require a lot of thought and kind of the, the kind of deep work type stuff that maybe about being creative and coming up with new ideas, creating a new model and writing emails for email marketing, writing, you know, for a, a book or a blog post or creating videos and that kind of stuff, creative work and the stuff that we sell, really important and requires you to think. And planning requires you to think as well. Um, whereas looking at emails is more reactive. Um, you get a good you can get a good feeling of satisfaction from them because, oh, someone had a problem, I'll quickly email them back and solve that problem. But it's not as high value as some of that big creative work you're doing. But it's an instant dopamine hit kind of thing. Oh, yeah, great, I solved that. Oh, I solved that. I solved... You feel kind of good, but actually you haven't really progressed your business a lot because that comes from the more creative work. Um, and I found myself, whenever I was, say, writing, let's say I was writing an email or writing a blog post, and inevitably you'd get stuck at some point and you'd think, oh, and you'd be struggling, you didn't know what came next. And it's far too easy to go, oh, I'll just check email. Right. Or, or, of course, I'll just check Facebook, I'll check LinkedIn, that kind of stuff. I'll just check email. Um, or you're standing quietly, you know, if, if and quiet time and being bored is really important, I think, because it's where it's where new ideas come from. New ideas come when your mind is quiet. And it's difficult nowadays because if you're sitting there quietly, you know, by yourself or you're waiting in a queue or any kind of activity where nothing's happening, I'll just check my phone. I'll just check Facebook. And I'll just check emails. Emails on your phone. It's there all the time. So in the olden days, you know, olden days being a few years ago, before you know, 10 years ago, you were, you were in the queue at the bank or something, or you might be in the garden or whatever, and you, you, there's nothing to distract you. To, and so you'd, you, your mind would be forced to think about things. And, it, and that's where great ideas came from. And that's where you began to reflect on things and think, how could, that, how could I do that? What could I do there? But nowadays you go, oh, let me just check email. Let me just check Facebook. And it stops you doing the bigger work. It's not that checking Facebook in for business or LinkedIn or email is useless. It's just not as valuable as some of the other stuff you could be doing that's harder work and maybe a bit painful. Um, but that's more valuable work. 
but it's easier, much, much easier to just do all check Facebook. I'll get a teeny bit done that's helpful for other people and helpful, you know, or I'll answer a question in a Facebook group or whatever. And it, that does help. That is good for you, but nowhere near as good as the thinking type stuff. So the first thing is um, what I try to do is, for example, I know people first thing in the morning will pick up their phone and check email or check social media. Just do not I'm do that. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of it's that. It's so bad for you, though, isn't it? It's like because you I mean, the, the other thing about your brain is it's only got so much mental capacity. It's only got so much energy it can use. And when you wake up, I'm a little bit groggy. So maybe 30 minutes after I've woken up and I've had a coffee, my brain is at its best. Um, even though I'm a night owl and how I get, I get a, you know, a little bit more energy there, really my brain is clean and fresh. I've been refreshed. I've had a sleep. After about 15, 30 minutes, had a coffee. I'm ready to think. But you can waste that energy. But if you're checking your emails... It's stuff that doesn't require your full concentration and doesn't need you to do super thinking, but it uses up your energy. And so two hours later, when you've been through all the emails and whatever, and you then say, right now, I've got to write that article. And your brain has only got half the energy it had before and you can't do such a good job or, or a job at all. So it's like, so what I would say was, if you can, and you, and you can, there's no reason why you need to check email first thing in the morning or social media. It's a very, nothing is so urgent, really, that it needs your immediate attention first thing in the morning. Um, even though my customers and whatever, all, everything comes in via email, it doesn't have to be dealt with straight away. The rea that's the reality. It does not. I have an emergency channel for getting through to me, and it's text messages. They're the only thing that beat me on my phone. Um, and if, you know, somebody, if my wife has an emergency and she needs me and my kids, they text me and it beeps. And that's the only thing that'll disturb me. Um, so email certainly doesn't. And not all the notifications are off. So first thing in the morning, I, I get up and I do some planning. And I think, what am I going to do today? And where am I going to do my bits of activities? And what's my block of, where am I going to do my thinky time? And I plan that. And included in that is some time spent on emails. Um, so I might say like half an hour before lunch, I'll process emails. So I'll do some, some big thinking, then I'll process emails you know, half an hour before lunch, and then again, maybe at five o'clock. So in theory, I'm in control of email. Now, I'm going to tell you, in all honesty, I do not live up to that all the time. You know, there are plenty of days where I'll just, I'll get up, oh, oh, I'm going to, and I'll tell myself, oh, there might be an important email. Oh, I wonder if that was a big question I asked that person, or you know, I was really, and I'll check email. Email and, expert once said that your email is everybody else's to-do list for you. Yes, it is. They're right. They're right. And so, and you kid yourself that, that it's important to check it. And, and you do, and then you're lost for a few hours and your brain's worn out then. You don't get as much good work done. And sometimes I'll do a day where I haven't actually even made my daily plan because I got distracted at the start and it kind of ruins the rest of the day. So that first half an hour where I do planning is really important. And then ideally I wanted to be doing some thinking and then I'll process emails and stuff like that. So in a way, that wasn't really a tip for it. It was a tip for avoiding email in a way or, or, or controlling email, because like any social media that, as you say, is other people's stuff for you, it's both, you know, it's both other people's stuff. So it's not your priority, but it's addictive because you get an immediate hit of, oh, I've achieved something. I've achieved a little thing. It's like, you know, the way the um, the uh, the gambling companies have, have optimized right. their fruit the machine, slot machine. Or, 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 yeah, slot machines to give you a little payout, um, a, almost a random payout frequently is much better than a big jackpot every now and then to get you addicted because random little wins gets you gets you hooked and you come back for more. And email's just like that. You get a random little win of, oh, I answered someone's question. Oh, I did that. I feel good about myself. The big win of, you know, writing your book or doing an article or making a video or coming up with a great new idea that could really help your business, that is hard. And it doesn't happen straight away. So you don't get that immediate, you know, sugar rush from it. So, so it's much easier just to get, get the stuff. In. And then you, then you, be, you does become addictive. Um, so that if you plan yourself like that, plan your activities like that, it does help, but it takes a while to get, to break yourself out of that cycle of thinking that I'd absolutely, I mean, sir, I, I remember, and I think the first thing to do is if you're going to do, do your 30 minutes planning and then do emails straight away because you'll otherwise you'll be shaking. <laughs> but, but after maybe a week you'll go you know what I'm, i'll move email to 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or how, whenever you get up i get up late but i'll move it to 11 o'clock and then maybe you can move it to just before lunch and then maybe you know be, because you realize after a while that actually nothing much changed you know you did your emails later you still 
answered people's questions. Nobody died because you didn't answer an email first thing right. in the morning. <laughs> so you feel OK. Um, but you do worry and you do get that immediate hit. So it is very addictive. So that would be my big email productivity tip. Don't do it first thing in the morning. Plan your day. Plan the big, difficult tasks, the thinking tasks, and then slot email around them and try and stick to that schedule. Of course, you won't be able to because we're all human, but do try. Yeah, and, and just don't let your inbox control you and tell you when you need to do something. That's that's a good way of saying it. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. Um, you know, it is, and and you know, it's more difficult for us nowadays than it used to be because it used to be that we would, especially when we're working remotely, um, all our stuff is coming in through email. You know, when I worked in an office properly for a company, most of my to-do list would come from interactions with other people or in those days on the phone and stuff. So when I started working for myself and I was largely working from home, all my to-do list came from email. So there's a temptation to be on email all the time. Um, but it doesn't need to be that way. Your to-do list is just the same if you read your emails three times a day during the day and go through it a bit more systematically and and kind of tie, star them or whatever tool you use. It doesn't really matter, but whatever your tool you use for, for doing your to-do list, do it in, in a batch instead of having to check every five minutes in case something urgent comes in. Nice. And now I'm going to ask you about the business side of productivity. What are some ways that you help your clients to be more productive with emails or manage your team in terms of how they manage your clients through pro productivity with emails? OK, well, I don't I don't have a team. I'm like an avowed solo. Um, OK, nice. The, and it's partially because I'm just rubbish at managing people. I, I, found, <laughs> I used to manage very big consulting teams and I was great at ideas and working with clients and the content stuff. I was not a good team manager. And so... I decided at some point that was not for me. I may have had a nudge as well, Ian, you know, be good at that. Um, I was very popular, but I just was not a great manager. Um, so I, I just like to do my own stuff. So it's my own productivity or, or client stuff. Um, you know, it, I don't think there's a great magic secret to it. I don't think that. Um, so if, you, if it comes to writing emails for, from an email marketing perspective, one of the big things I have learned, I think, is that it is very, very difficult to sit down and think of a topic for an email and then to write that email straight away. It's really hard because you start questioning. What happens is you get a topic and you think of a topic and you go through, you know, OK, I'll do this one. Right. And then as soon as it starts to get hard, which it will, you'll go, oh, yeah, oh, but that's not as easy as I thought. You'll question the topic and you'll go back and you'll think, oh, no, I'll not do that. I'll do another one. Right. And you end up going round and round in circles. So what I would advise is split the process in two. And at some point in time, like once a month, once a week or whatever, sit down and just plan out your topics for your emails and, and brainstorm the topics. And if you brainstorming for something you don't then have to immediately do is much easier. So, That's so I mean, I like to do it in two steps. So I might think of themes. So I'll say, you know what, I'm going to write three or four emails all about building authority as a, as a, as a, as an expert in your field. Okay, great, great. And what are the topics? Oh, well, perhaps I'm going to do one with a, um, a story from my past about where I managed to do it. Okay. Or where I managed or when I messed it up more usually. Um, and then I'll do one, maybe a funny one about, you know, what I learned from watching a TV show. And then I'll do what, and then something, oh, I remember that great tip on, on authority. I'll, I'll do one on that. And I'll come up with a list of three or four, either ideas for emails or a specific topic for an email and right, put those to one side. Then, then maybe I should write three or four emails about email marketing because that's what's one of the things I talk about. Okay, what are you going to write about? Oh, actually, you should do one on how to get more subscribers. Okay, you should maybe do one on how to write fun, engaging emails. Okay, and the topics flow because you don't you don't have to write them, um, and it's really easy to write topics for other people to write as well. Um, so just do all that brainstorming, put it to one side, maybe come back a day later and go and you know refine it, change it around, improve it, or whatever. But then when it comes to actually writing the emails, a day or so later at least, you go through them in sequence and you are forced to write about that topic. So when there's no choice, when, okay, I said I would write an email about authority that was based on a mistake I made. Okay, well, right, let's just get on and do it. And, and it, then it's much easier to just write on that one topic. I found this when one of the things I do with clients is we have a, like kind of a, a, um, a Facebook group for my clients who are in my momentum club thing 
And one of the things they really like um, and have encouraged me to do more of is we do little challenges every now and then. And yeah. particularly we do a writing challenge. So we did a while, it was last year we did a, a five day LinkedIn writing challenge. It ended up as a 30 day one because people, oh, do another week, do another week. And the thing they found the best was every day I would kind of wake up and think, here's the topic you're going to write a LinkedIn post about. And I would post it up and give them some tips either on the topic itself. So, you know, maybe the, so the a topic would be write a LinkedIn post about, um, you know, something you learned from a book or write a LinkedIn post about a mistake you made and what you learned from it and how I that applies to business or whatever. So, um, and they said it was really, you know, not easy, but all of them managed to do it either in 10 minutes or maybe 30 minutes or sometimes an hour, but largely it was shorter and they got better at it because they had no choice. Because it was like, well, they couldn't question it because I told them to do it. And there was no other topic they could do. So whenever they came up against the inevitable, oh, this is a bit hard. I, I can't do it. They couldn't walk away from it. They had to go, okay, let's just think a bit harder. Let's just think a bit harder. Let's try some other ideas. All right, I've got it. And there. But the problem is, if you've got the choice of just rechanging your topic, right. you get to that pause bit, oh, this is hard. And you go, oh, I'll try again. And you just go round and round. But you've got to live in that gap of, of hard before right. you get to, oh, all right, I've got it. Right. And if you have no choice to go back, you're forced to do it. And you can, that's why I said write your own topics earlier and don't give yourself the choice of changing it. Just say, this is the topic I'm going to write about it. And that makes it a lot easier. That's my big productivity tip for writing is to separate the thinking of the ideas from the writing of the idea. Uh, and and that, that just helps um you just make it just makes it possible somehow the creative process is, is slightly different in both cases and being forced to write about a certain topic forces you to push through the difficulties you might have on that topic that makes sense uh, but i would just just an additional question is one of the things that most people struggle with when they're writing an email i know that you need to add value i know that you need to make sure that it's coming from the reader's perspective and i know that it needs to again just have all the detail that you need, be detailed, be short, be to the point. But there are moments where you write an email and you'll feel like this is, this is, this is not a good email. Or you'll be like, is this a good email? So how, what are some ways that we can be like, okay, this is a, this is a pretty good email. This is a bad email. Or I know it's a little bit broad, but how do you know if your email is, the copy is written well? That's that. That is that is both a good question and a difficult question. Um, so I would, there, I think there are a few a few kind of rules of thumb you can use, um, but at the end of the day, the kind of overriding thing is it, it is difficult because it has to it has to sound like you, for example, and I will I don't sound like other people, etc. So you, you have to learn. I think over time you learn what's a good email for you if you've written a lot of them because you get feedback and. Even And of course, you can measure the sales that come from certain emails, but that's really difficult to correlate that completely. But if you do get feedback from people that they really like this and this worked for them or this meant a lot to them, that can help. Um, but uh, I think one is, you know, is this just about a single topic? Have I kept this simple and focused it on a single kind of idea or topic and even if it's you know I'm not a big fan of the seven tips 57 tips for doing this great on a blog post but I think in an email it, it can be too much because by the emails too you can write long emails if you've earned the right from the previous stuff you've sent to write a long email and people will tune in yeah I, bet, I find it's better to write more short emails than one big long email because if you write a big long single email People have to set aside 15 minutes to read it. That's hard for them. If you write, you know, five three-minute emails, it's easy for people to set aside, oh, oh, I can quickly read that. So it's easier to do five three-minute emails than one 15-minute email for, for people receiving it, I think. So write more shorter emails. But that means each email has to be quite succinct and just about one point. So just try and make one point in the email. Um, partially that's the, you know, the readability side, but partially also people can only take on one idea. 
at a time. You know, it's hard to expect them to take on five different concepts. Uh, I mean, the nature in which people are going to be reading emails on their phone or just on their screen, they're not going to be in their deepest mode of concentration. So you've got to make it quite easy for them. So keep to a single point. And if it is seven tips on something, it's got to be on the same thing. And, it, you know, the, you've got to be able to tie those tips together so they can go, oh, that's really making the point of this. I should do this. Um, so keep it simple and on a single point. Just make it a little bit entertaining by introducing with the story to make it intriguing. I think is because uh, and they're making a bit of a personal connection and bond there. Oh, a story in bad sales meeting. Oh, that sounds interesting. Let's continue. Um, so a bit of a story, but don't you know? Don't you have to go overboard? Keep it simple, um, simply written. Make it sure it's written as you. Make one main point. Um, and then obviously for most business emails, you want to be having a call to action. Um, I don't always have a call to action because sometimes a call to action is, is I want to embed things in people's head. I want them, if you think about, more, email is often thought about as a direct marketing medium. With right. a direct marketing medium, you want people to take an action. It's great. But sometimes, you know, if your buyers um, are not going to buy straight away, um, Sometimes you you know just call to action is just there for the sake of it. Sometimes the real thing I want is just to change their perception of me, to realize that I actually know about a topic, that I'm an expert in something, or I'm a nice guy and I'd be okay to work with and, and stuff like that. So the email itself is changing their memory, changing their warming perception. Warming them up to you, warming them up to you. And that's a good enough, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. Now if it might give them a call to action to do something, but sometimes a call to action can spoil it as well. If I make once in a blue moon, I will write an email that's maybe a little bit emotional, almost making an ethical point about marketing and what we should and shouldn't be doing. And if I've just made, sent an email that said, you know, um, yeah, I don't know, something about ethics in marketing and you should never. You, and I, I ha, there's a famous saying in marketing about, you know, as long as you fully believe in your product, you should sell it as hard as possible and whatever. Right. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that because I think there are boundaries you can cross where you manip, you, you know, where you're lying to people essentially. Right. And it doesn't matter how great a cause it is, you should not lie. Right. Um, and so I might write about that in a, in an email. And at the end of that, then to have a call to action. By the way, click here to join my club. I think that undermines the message of the yeah. email. So sometimes a call to action is the wrong thing. If the important thing is you want to leave them with an important message. Um, I don't know how I got into that rambled, sorry, but basically keep them simple. It's a bit of a story. One main point, write like it's you. Single call to action if you have one, but you don't need a call to action. Sometimes the them getting the message from the email is enough. And that can help you to connect with people so that they can look out for your next email. Yes, well, that's the thing. And, you know, I think you're going to ask about what's happening, you know, in the future of email. Right. And, the, you know, the, the big thing, one of the big things... It, uh, there's a there's a, some nice science being done um, on the science of attention um, and what gets people to pay attention to you. And there's a good book called, by, called Captivology by Ben Powell, which summarizes it in layman's terms, Love which the only terms I'm going to understand. Um, and he splits attention into three. It's immediate, short and long. Immediate is like you hear a noise, you turn, you're drawn towards it. So that might be, you know, a, an image that you see on Facebook where it looks right. really different and, you, and you, you can't help but look at it. Then the short attention where you begin to get a bit more engaged. So that might be, you know, immediate attention and email might be the subject line. That looks really different. I've never seen that before. And then they read it a bit or maybe the first paragraph. That's short. They get engaged. They're basically deciding, am I going to read the whole thing? Right. Long attention is the valuable thing where they keep coming back for more like their favorite TV show. And so it's exactly as you were just saying, if your email persuades them to keep coming back for more, so you've got them, if they're hooked on your TV show, essentially, your emails, then you have a chance to get more important stuff across. You have a chance to make more calls to action. Um, so that getting people to keep coming back, and that's long attention, that's driven by value. That's driven them by get some, getting something useful from your email. And if they do, they'll open the next one and the next one, next one. And that's really important, you know, because email is not a one-shot medium. Email is not, I have to write a really, a single email blast or cold list, yeah. Uh, but that's why it's so difficult because you have to make, do everything all in one email. For most of us, if we write a good email that's valuable to people, they'll come back for more. And we can gently drip our messages, drip our credibility in. We don't have to prove we're the world's greatest expert in one email. That's impossible. We've got 20 emails, 30 emails. Because if, as long as we add enough value that they keep on coming back for more. Nice, nice. Well, 
Thank you so much. I mean, as someone who lives in her inbox as well, I know that I look out for a few people when they're sending me emails. So that's True. definitely something that I do as well. So One of the things I always advise people to do in email marketing is to make sure their very first email that people get after they've signed up is a brilliant email. It's kind of your best work because that's the email that most people will read. Um, so you want it to deliver tremendous value and also so they can see and also hint at the value they're going to get from the follow-up the follow emails. I know I've seen some recommendations of, you know, your first email, welcome them, tell them they're going to be getting some great stuff. And it's right. like, yeah, but give them some great stuff. Nobody right. believes you if you tell them you're going to get great stuff. Give them some great stuff. I call it a barnstorming email. I don't know if that translates into other countries, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a barn, I suppose it does. Barnstorming's from America, isn't it? Those right. guys in the planes who used to, um, when when aeroplanes first first came around that excited the crowds do a brilliant first email that's tremendous value for people and hints at the the other value they're going to get from your future emails and that's going to increase the open rates going forward so that you know you've, you hook them as fast as you can so that they, they never leave I think is the the idea definitely thank you so much Ian for just joining us and sharing all of this information you definitely helped to cover on the productivity as a professional and just how to deal with it as you go through if you're considering using email or if you're already using emails already. All right, so that is our episode for Ask the Email Expert. And if you guys liked it, be sure to like and subscribe and share it with someone you think needs to hear this information. And we'll see you guys next week.